So, uh, hello, my name is Claire Rusbridge and I am a veterinary neurologist. I'm currently working at Fitzpatrick Referrals, a specialty referral practice, and I'm also a professor of veterinary neurology at the University of Surrey. Uh, we're going to be talking today uh, on feline neurology, um, a subject which is uh, often neglected. We often sometimes think of cats as small dogs. Um, in many subjects, we're sort of leaving that behind in internal medicine. Um, but in neurology, sometimes they're not um, dealt with in the specific way that they should. So we're going to really concentrate on them. Uh, we're going to start by neuro-ophthalmology, focusing first on uh, assessment of visual loss in the cat and then dealing with some of the other cranial nerves that affect the eyes and the face. Um, and then we're going to move on to the ataxic cat, um, looking at it in a very problem-based approach. So first of all, uh, how to assess ataxia and what it is, then looking at ataxic gates, then looking at specific problems such as head tilt and circling, loss of reflexes, and covering various different systems, including the cerebellum, vestibular system, and spinal cord diseases. Um, in the afternoon, we're going to go back to the brain uh, and talk about approach to seizures and management of epilepsy in the cat. And then we're going to look at the aging cat and specifically how to recognize and manage cognitive decline. And we're going to round off the day by looking at neuromuscular diseases and focusing on the problem of how to deal with the weak cat and especially how to recognize those neuromuscular diseases because they often get forgotten about and some tips on how to diagnose them and management. So um, well, this is really the evaluation of the cranial nerves but I th uh, when I was sort of composing this I thought well actually um, there are some cranial nerve deficits that you just really rarely see in the cat. Things like the trochlea and the adducens and all these vague words from, from neuroanatomy. And so we're really just going to concentrate on, on, on what is common uh, and also blindness. So first of all, when you're assessing vision, uh, it's important to be aware that um, you need to do a number of, of tests, especially in the cat. Uh, it's not just one, um, one test. Uh, first of all, tracking an object. I find that that is always the most useful. And you can see from this, it's not a video, but you can see from this picture, I think all of you agree this cat can see. And that's because it's directly looking at that cotton wool ball. Uh, and it's important to use something which is fairly, uh, I always use something white because of course it may be brightly colored to you, but in an animal which is colorblind uh, or having very muted colors, it may not be quite so bright. And it's also important to use something that doesn't have a smell um, and also something that doesn't have a sound. And so if you don't have cotton wool in your consulting room, I always find that nurses uh, in my uh, practice, I'm extremely diligent at cleaning up any cotton wool, even if you've got it in a little baggie in your consulting room desk. So I'm kind of always having to go and uh, get some more. Then we have menace response. And I'd like to pay attention to the fact it's response. It's not reflex. And that's important because a reflex is something that when you do a stimulus, there is a reflex action. A response is a more coordinated, well, response. And um, that's important purely because, first of all, it's learnt. Um, so you don't see it in very young kittens and puppies. And two, it can be affected by many different things. So as we're going to talk about, the absence of a menace response is, um, is affected by more than one thing. And you can see in this menace response, actually done incorrectly for a cat, which we're going to be talking about later, you can tell again that this cat can see, even though it's a picture, uh, because you can see the posture of the cat. It is threatened by this uh, hand coming towards its face. You can see it's tense, it's going back. So the menace response is really protecting um, the eye, is what you're assessing, but really the, the whole um, uh, animal will often uh, uh, go back and the eye will retract into the bowl, uh, into the globe. 
And then we have um, the papillary light reflex and the dazzle. The papillary light reflex, uh, as no doubt you're aware when you're assessing a comatose animal, is a brainstem reflex. Um, and so it uh, is nothing to do with, with um, vision. And that's a, that's a confusion that, um, um, that it is easy to understand because, of course, you need an intact eye and you need an intact optic nerve for the papillary light reflex to work. But it's not vision. Um, it's um, merely the response of the pupil to light. Um, and, um, and, and so it's very different to, to vision, but we use the papillary light reflex to help localize the problem to the eye or to the optic nerve, uh, uh, as we'll talk about in the next slide. And then we have the dazzle. Um, and the dazzle is also a reflex. It's a response to bright light, uh, and it's the eye closing. Um, and it is... Um, what we call a subcortical reflex, which means that you need to have the subcortex intact. Um, but uh, that's uh, something to bear in mind, that you can have actually a dazzle in a comatose or recently euthanized, not quite dead, animal. Um, so uh, what I'm saying is that it doesn't necessarily uh, mean the animal has an intact uh, cortex. So those are the main uh, ones that are done. And of course, the other one would be uh, negotiation of your consulting room or, um, or, or, or the room.